the mysterious life insurance salesman that invented modern American music. Once upon a time, in the bustling city of New York, circa 1907, an unassuming life insurance broker from Connecticut became one of the boldest and most influential American composers of the 20th century. Well, kind of. With his work sitting outside mainstream popularity, the way he blended musical ideas was revolutionary, providing a glimpse into the future where sampled music, mashups, and mixed genres would saturate the radio stations, and ambisonic and spatial audio would become the future technology for audio playback. Today, on Strange Obscure Stories, we explore his life and how he balanced his roles of insurance executive by day, yet mad composer by night. Well, while it's become a cliche that strange music comes from mad musicians, Charles Ives distinguished himself by balancing his innovative musical pursuits with a pragmatic lifestyle, embodying the ethos of a practical Connecticut Yankee. Aware that his forward-thinking compositions lacked commercial viability, Ives secured his financial future in the insurance sector while continuing his musical endeavors privately. His perspective is captured in a poignant reflection from his memos where he questions the viability of a composer's life in providing for a family. Quote, if he has a nice wife and some nice children, how can he let the children starve on his dissonances? End quote. His dual dedication to a conventional career and creating a uniquely American original musical oeuvre stands out as an extraordinary example in modern history. Charles Edward Ives was born in late 1874 in Danbury, Connecticut, a small city famous for hat making. Son of U.S. Army band leader George Ives, Charles was born into a musical family with access to his father's choirs, marching bands, and orchestras. He would later be inspired by his experimentations with bitonal and polytonal harmonizations. Around town, he was simply his father's son, following in his father's footsteps by taking up the post of church organist from the age of 14 and even composing his own hymns and church songs along the way, such as Variations on America, which is played in multiple key signatures simultaneously. In Charles Ives' Life with Music, Jan Swafford's 1996 biography, a telling anecdote illustrates George's impact on his son's musical philosophy. Addressing Charles's curiosity about tolerating a stonemason's off-key singing in the church choir, George advised, Watch him closely and reverently. Look into his face and hear the music of the ages. Don't pay too much attention to the sounds, for if you do, you may miss the music. You won't get a wild, heroic ride to heaven on pretty little sounds. This lesson profoundly influenced Charles's approach to music, emphasizing the authenticity of raw, emotive performances, whether from a fervent choir or a patriotic town band, over the flawless precision of symphony orchestras. Yet this created the seeming paradox of a Connecticut accountant from Yale with the seemingly unbridled crashing of influences, anthems, and atmospheres that pervaded his compositions. According to Ives expert John Kirkpatrick, when asked what he played, Ives responded, Shortstop! Because aside from his music, he was also known for his baseball playing. This led him to the Hopkins School baseball team captaincy before continuing to study at Yale as a mentee of Horatio Parker in September of 1894. At Yale, Charles enjoyed playing on the varsity American football team so well that his coach lamented what a crying shame it was that what could have been a career champion sprinter was wasting his time on music. But only two months later, his father died. Charles was devastated. During this period of mourning, while Ives conformed outwardly, encountering resistance to his experimental inclinations, he composed a late romantic piece for his college thesis, Symphony No. 1. Although not premiered until 1953, the traditional four-movement symphony remains significant for its demonstration of Ives' early mastery, despite frequently being overshadowed by his more adventurous works. 
After graduation, Charles moved to New York City to share an apartment with his fraternity brothers, serving as an organist at Central Presbyterian Church while pursuing his business career in the actuary department at Mutual Lives before moving swiftly to Raymond and Company. In 1906, the company folded and Charles started his own life insurance agency with his friend and now business partner, Julian Merrick. Their innovative firm laid the foundations for the future of estate planning. It was around 1907, too, that Charles experienced his first so-called heart attack, a pattern that would continue to plague him for years. Some question whether this was, in fact, a heart attack or an anxiety disorder, but it also flagged the start of one of his most creative periods. During this time, he maintained his passions, composing numerous pieces that were trialed within the church, despite often receiving a frosty reception. After one performance, it said that Pastor Smith turned around and glowered at the choir. As a result of this disinterest in his work, many of Charles's compositions from this period were lost during a subsequent building move in 1915. The significant works that came from this period included Symphony No. 2 and Piano Sonata No. 2, often called the Concord Sonata. This work is one of Charles Ives' most celebrated compositions, paying homage to the transcendentalist movement with each of its four movements dedicated to a different figure from that era, including Ralph Waldo Emerson, Nathaniel Hawthorne, the Alcotts, and Henry David Thoreau, while requiring the pianist to use a piece of wood 14 and three quarter inches wide to create a massive cluster chord. This became known as the Ives Block, In 1908, Ives married Harmony Twitchell, the daughter of a congregational minister. After adopting their daughter Edith, the couple started a family as robust as his career. Still, he faced the inner turmoil of a composer isolated from the musical mainstream, with most of his work so advanced in their structure, dissonance, or ensemble structure that they were daunting even for professional orchestras. One example is The Unanswered Question, which juxtaposes a serene string background with a haunting trumpet call and a quizzical woodwind quartet. Intended to be performed with the musicians out of sight from one another, the piece brings physical and technical challenges encapsulating Ives' fascination with the eternal queries of existence. The strings represent the silence of the druids, the trumpet, the perennial question of existence, and the increasingly agitated flutes portray the futile attempts to answer the unanswerable. The spatial separation of the musicians adds to the sense of isolation and the unattainability of a definitive answer while simultaneously providing an intriguing challenge for the players and conductor. Central Park in the Dark is a tone poem that transports the listener to a New York soundscape at the turn of the century. Ives reconstructs the ambiance of Central Park at twilight, intertwining the tranquil with the chaotic, capturing a world within the calm of nature and the vibrancy of near-urban life. The Holiday Symphony, which he composed between 1897 and 1913, is a monumental expression of the American experience. Utilizing intricate polytonality and unorthodox harmonies, Ives transcends mere technical brilliance to encapsulate the essence of the American spirit. This symphony, more than a mere recollection of Ives' childhood holidays in New England, is his portrayal of American community life. Each moment paints a different picture, from the slightly askew melodies of a barn dance in Washington's birthday to the contemplative Decoration Day that resonates with solemnity and remembrance, and the boisterous celebratory sounds of Fourth of July. These are not just memories, but musical narratives that embody the emotions of life's journey. The symphony concludes with Thanksgiving and Forefathers Day, a movement that Henry Cowell observed was designed to represent the sternness and strength and austerity of the Puritan character. Alongside these puritanical themes, Ives weaves in motifs of folk and harvest, painting an oral tapestry of autumn in New England. 
The work reaches a powerful apex with a robust rendition of the Thanksgiving hymn, Duke Street, engaging both orchestra and chorus in a potent and emotionally charged finale, underscoring the symphony's place as a masterwork of American composition. Finished later in 1916, Symphony No. 4 was adapted through the 1920s and continues this theme being one of Ives' most complex orchestral works, blending various styles and techniques to include a massive ensemble with multiple choirs, two pianos, a theremin, and a vast battery of percussion. It's a piece that stretches the boundaries of symphonic form, requiring two conductors in performance due to its intricate rhythms and layering of sound. The symphony pushed the limits of what was once considered performable, and indeed it remained unperformed until 1965, over a decade after his death. The RMS Lusitania was a luxury ocean liner launched by the Cunard Line in 1906. On May 1, 1915, the ship left New York bound for Liverpool. On May 7, 1915, it was torpedoed by an Imperial German Navy U-boat. The ship sank in less than 20 minutes. Out of the 1,959 passengers and crew, only 761 survived, and the incident turned public opinion in many countries against Germany and precipitated the United States' entrance into the First World War. On that tragic day, as news of the Lusitania's attack spread across New York City, Ives witnessed passengers at a train platform spontaneously sing In the Sweet By and By, aligning with a nearby barrel organ's melody. Charles Ives' orchestral set number two captures this sentiment in its concluding movement from Hanover Square North at the end of a tragic day, the people's voice again arose. Around 1918, Ives experienced a significant decline in his creative output, coinciding with a mysterious and potent health crisis. The decline in his health and creative output has been attributed to a severe heart attack. However, Ives was somewhat evasive about his health issues. His wife, Harmony Ives, referred to this period as when he had exhausted the vein of his composition. Subsequent biographers have suggested various reasons for his decline, including psychological, spiritual, and personal causes. Some have speculated that the decline was due to the prolonged mourning of his father, or that he was suffering from neurasthenia, a condition associated with nervous exhaustion common among overworked businessmen and creatives of that era. However, new insights into Ives' medical history revealed that he was diagnosed with diabetes in August 1918, at a time when the condition was often fatal and treatments were limited. The diagnosis would have been a severe blow to both his physical and mental well-being. Insulin, the life-saving treatment for diabetes, wasn't available until 1923, which meant that Ives would have been subjected to strict and debilitating dietary restrictions that could have affected his mental health and contributed to his artistic silence. And of course, he didn't know that insulin would be invented in 1923. In 1927, it was recorded that he lamented to his wife that he could compose no more, that nothing sounded right. The diabetes took a severe toll on Ives' health, causing drastic weight loss and periods of profound despair. Despite this, he continued to work diligently to secure his legacy, distributing his Concord Sonata and 114 songs for free and making substantial contributions to his insurance business. The revelation of his diabetes offers a deeper understanding of the decline of his compositional activity and sheds light on the struggle he faced during his final years. By 1933, Ives had finished an autobiography titled Memos and had heard some subpar performances of his orchestral compositions, but none of his piano work. As a result, he recorded the Ives Plays Ives collection from 1933 to 1943. 
These historical recordings were captured on various media, with Ives visiting the recording studio four times. His first session was at the Columbia Graphophone Company in London, where he recorded four short tracks on shellac discs before venturing to a New York City studio to add additional tunes onto aluminum speakerphone discs. In 1938, he returned to the Melatone Recording Company in New York City, where he recorded on lacquer-coated discs before making his final recording session on April 24, 1943, at Mary Shipman Howard's studio, again using lacquer-coated discs. These records provide insight into Ives' interpretative style and authentically represent his intended tempos, rhythms, and dynamics, including his renditions of well-known compositions such as the Alcott's from the Piano Sonata No. 2 and They Are There, a patriotic song reflecting his response to World War II. Shipman Howard recalled that Ives received letters from conductors and performers intending to perform his pieces, asking how they should interpret the music, to which he responded, Interpret? Interpret? What are they talking about? If they don't know anything about music, well, all right, I'll tell them. Ives' music began gaining public recognition later, with prominent performances in the late 1930s and 40s advocated by notable figures such as Leonard Bernstein and Leopold Stokowski. In 1947, his third symphony earned him the Pulitzer Prize in music. Still, despite the posthumous recognition of his music, Ives died in 1954 without fully realizing the extent of his impact the true breadth of his influence was acknowledged only through subsequent performances and historical projects, with his formerly critical Central Presbyterian Church performing an All Ives program in 1986. Despite the initially lackluster reception, the techniques of Ives influenced later composers and musicians. He received praise and acknowledgement of his influence from Arnold Schoenberg, Gustav Mahler, and film composer Bernard Herrmann. Igor Stravinsky astutely credits Ives for writing music for the 1960s back in the time of Debussy. Indeed, a composer of the future. John Cage, the hugely influential experimental composer who brought us the infamous 4 minutes and 33 seconds, essentially silence, praised Ives in his written work Two Statements on Ives, pointing out, Ives knew that if sound sources came from different points in space, that that fact was in itself interesting. Nobody before him had thought about this. Well, except maybe Berlioz, in this particular way. Frank Zappa's sophisticated compositions, which blend various genres, were partly inspired by Ives' trailblazing spirit. He wrote an instrumental piece called Charles Ives as a Tribute. Elliot Carter's acknowledgement of Ives' complex rhythms and harmonic schemes can be seen as a nod to Ives' enduring influence on his work. Phil Lesh, bassist for The Grateful Dead, cites Ives as one of his two musical heroes. Similarly, the renowned Kronos Quartet has performed and recorded works by Ives, acknowledging his importance in the evolution of American music and his influence on their approach to genre-defying classical music. Ultimately, Ives' work anticipated many of the innovations of 20th century music, including atonality and polyrhythm, mashing up genres, ambient music, and spatial audio, and it is with great regret that he suffered such distaste towards his compositions for most of his lived years. However, today Charles Ives is heralded as a seminal figure in American music. He was featured on a postage stamp, and he's a composer who eschewed the safety of the musical status quo to forge a path that was as challenging as it was inspiring and uplifting. His works continue to be performed, studied, and revered for their innovative spirit and visceral phenomenological approach to life in America. If you enjoyed this episode of Strange Obscure Stories, please do remember to like, subscribe, and share this with your friends. 
Due to copyright concerns, we've not been able to use the music of Charles Ives as much as we would wish, but we do encourage you to go find it on streaming services, vinyl or compact disc. <laughs>